Olá, muito bom dia, sejam todos muito bem-vindos ao colóquio da pós-graduação do IFGW. Eu sou Rafael Rabelo, sou professor do Departamento de Física da Matéria Condensada. E antes de eu anunciar nosso palestrante de hoje, um rápido aviso. Essa apresentação ela está sendo gravada e será disponibilizada publicamente. Então, por favor, mantenham os vídeos e os áudios desligados. Caso vocês desejem se identificar, vocês automaticamente concordam com a divulgação pública da sua manifestação. Agora, para apresentar o nosso convidado, eu vou passar a falar em inglês. So, I'm happy and honored to present today's speaker, my friend and, and mentor, Professor Valerius Carani, of the Center for Quantum Technologies and the Department of Physics of National University of Singapore. Valerio was born and raised in Milan, Northern Italy, and pursued higher education in science at the Federal Polytechnic School of Lausanne in Switzerland. There, he graduated as a physical engineer and then as a PhD in physics. His thesis is on experimental nuclear magnetic resonance studies in magnetic nanostructures. He then moved to the University of Geneva, also in Switzerland, and became a researcher on theoretical quantum information and the foundations of quantum theory. Since 2007, he is principal investigator at the Center for Quantum Technologies and professor at the Department of Physics of the University of National University of Singapore. Valerio has supervised over 20 PhD students, including myself and postdocs, and published over 150 papers, including seminal works on the foundations of quantum theory, quantum information quantum optics, and more recently, quantum thermodynamics. In today's colloquium, he will give a talk uh, on some of his latest results. The talk of the title, the, the title of the talk is a little hard to say, but I'll give it a try. Irreversibility as irretrodictability. So Valerio, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. The virtual floor is yours. Okay, hey, thank you, Rafael. Uh, well, I'm very glad that uh, I can give this talk at least online. I hope one day I'll be able to come to Brazil. Uh, and uh, so this talk is uh, uh, what I would call a COVID project. So um, I'm, unfortunately, uh, most of us, uh, I'm happy to enjoy now some freedom in Vienna, but most of you, probably most of the world, are still suffering from uh, this situation. and. Uh, At the, quite at the beginning, uh, in the first lockdown in uh, last year, uh, you know, we are not very happy of all this. And I started talking to my friend Francesco Buscemi in Nagoya, another Italian who ended up in, in Asia. And, you know, we have a couple of Zoom chats and then discussed and so on. And at some point, we started really collaborating. And uh, these two works are, uh, that are that mentioned here in the in the uh, in the title page are the result of this collaboration that now is taking a lot of uh, breath. One of my students is already working on it, uh, but we're really welcoming more people to join. Uh, by the way, the, the second paper the, that is mentioned there has been just published uh, in a journal, so um, I will update it soon. Okay, anyway, so there are these two words, uh, irreversibility that probably you know what it is, and I will try to uh, propose a way of uh, looking at irreversibility uh, in terms of Uh, retrodiction, and this is probably a word that um, that I will have to explain. So let's go first to irreversibility, just very quickly, right? So we know what uh, uh, the idea of irreversibility is, right? Uh, how do we have this feeling of irreversibility? There are some physical processes, very few of our everyday life, such that uh, if we were to watch the movie forward or backward, uh, where well, they would look exactly feasible, right? So in this, if I see this, this yellow ball hitting the, 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 the boundary and then hitting the red ball, the red ball gets moving. Uh, or if I play the move backward and I see the red ball moving and hitting the, the boundary and then hitting the white, the yellow ball, well, both moves make sense. So this is the typical process that we call reversible and this is what we are very confident with in physics. But as, course, as you know, uh, surely uh, all that happens in our life is most of the other type. And, um, The irreversible process is one such that if you see the movie going from the egg being intact to the egg being broken, this makes perfect sense. But if you see the, the, the if you were to see the movie played backward, you would see that there's something fishy going on, right? So this is what we call irreversible. 
Now, scientists have been, uh, surely you know that they've been discussing these uh, ideas so for, for, for many years. Let me go through um, some, uh, so here's the, yeah, the, 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 you know, the, the idea of move map, watch backward makes no sense. And let me go through uh, a list of, bit of history very quickly. So probably the first person that uh, uh, has studied these kind of things in a systematic way is usually, I mean, considered to be Boltzmann. By the way, I'm uh, giving a talk from uh, uh, the address of Boltzmann Gasse here in Vienna, so it's very appropriate. And you might have heard this famous age theorem that I will not go into. Um, it's an attempt to uh, prove that the dynamical system can show irreversibility. However, this attempt is vastly considered as um, not conclusive, and there have been many criticism. And ultimately, the criticism is indeed what you would expect, right? So, if I start from Newton's equations of motion that are reversible, how comes that? Um, so, I take a snapshot of my molecules, the classical, of course, that they look like, and I reverse all the velocities. Well, it also it also compatible. It's also compatible with Newton's equation of motion. But I would see, for instance, a gas that was. Um, uh, apparently in, ter in thermal equilibrium split between a hot and a cold, a hot on the left and a cold on the right, and which we don't see in everyday life. So it is kind of challenging to derive irreversibility when we believe that the underlying laws of physics are actually reversible. Um, well, things uh, in the more applied sense uh, took a different, uh, a different path later. So people started saying, okay, it happens often in physics, right? We forget a little bit about the conceptual things, and we just say, okay, let's put some numbers there and see if it works. Uh, and this led in the, let's say, first half, broadly speaking, of the 20th century to the famous fluctuation dissipation relations. I don't know if they are still taught in undergraduate education, but essentially the idea, if you want a little bit of uh, in a hand waving way, is the following, right? If something experiences friction when it is driven, it will experience fluctuations at rest. Okay, you can think of uh, dragging uh, something in a liquid, okay, you drag it, and of course, because there's a liquid, you experience some friction, then if you leave it there in the liquid, the thing will fluctuate. Why? Well, because this liquid is actually made of molecules, and these molecules are hitting the, this object from all possible directions, and precisely because these molecules are hitting the object from the possible direction is the cause both of fluctuations and of the dissipation of the friction, right? Uh, Canonical examples, of course, the study of Brownian motion by Einstein, 1906. Uh, some of you that may be more engineering oriented know the johnson nyquist thermal noise of an of a electrical component, usually a resistor, right? 1928, on-study reciprocity relation is more for chemists. And then, well, Callan and Kubo in the 1950s came up with some general approach based on spectral theory and other things. And then, okay, things go on, but uh, if you want the fluctuation dissipation relations are uh, something that is derived close to equilibrium, but in towards the end of the 20th century, people realized that we can have fluctuation relations even far from equilibrium. And uh, uh, of course it was first found by some Russians that um, we have not noticed until uh, some many years later. And then uh, the most famous ones uh, maybe have heard the Jarczynski equality and the Crookes uh, fluctuation theorem, 1997, 1998. I'm going to explain these two. First of all, I'm going to tell them what they say without giving a proof. And then at the end of the talk, I will give the proof. But my proof, not their proof. But I will go through, through a different path and we give the, the, the proof of these guys, these relations. So, so what are these? Okay, Jarczynski and Crookes. Okay, let's have a quick look. This is something that I would say um, should be part of the common knowledge of a practicing physicist in the, in the 20th century. I even knew about them before working in this topic because many colleagues are working in these things. So maybe some of you that are younger have not, never seen them before will take the advantage to learn about them. So what is the idea? Here, imagine a, a world, uh, there is a system in contact with a thermal reservoir and it is driven by, by us. And so work is done on the system from an initial equilibrium state to somewhere else. And then after pulling the system or pushing it or whatever we do to it, we let it equilibrate again. So the system goes from an initial equilibrium state to a final equilibrium state, but the process is not specified. So it doesn't need to be adiabatic. It doesn't need to be slow. It can be as irreversible as it gets. 
what textbook thermodynamics tells you is that the work that I have to provide to the system in order to uh, perform this, this transition must exceed or at best be equal to the difference in free energy before, between the initial and the final equilibrium state, between the final and the initial. Uh, right? So um, this is uh, the free energy because it's, uh, it's not only entropy that matters, right? It's uh, really the, uh, in, a, in contact with a thermal bath. It's, so this is, is a version of the second law of thermodynamics uh, when you're in contact with a thermal bath, in which you could have entropy that decreases provided energy decreases also pretty fast. And uh, um, now Jarzinski equality, I will state it without proof, tells you this, that, so if work is a stochastic variable, right? Imagine a system where when you do, when you try to do the, 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 this process, work is not deterministic, right? You can sometimes you a little bit more, a little bit less, okay? Then the average work is larger than the, 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 the difference in free energy. But Jarzinski discovered something almost miraculous, that if you take the average of the exponential of work, or more precisely minus, this inverse temperature times work, this is equal to the exponential of the free energy from which this can be derived by just convexity, the, the usual second law. But this is a kind of amazing statement, right? We have an equality relation. And again, this is supposed to work uh, to be true for every process that brings this uh, system uh, from the initial to the final equilibrium state uh, in contact, why, why being in contact with a thermal bath? It's a kind of amazing statement. And Crookes uh, somehow generalizes Jarzinski uh, by comparing the process and its reverse process. This is a very important notion. So you see that Jarzinski is about the, the forward process, right? the process you observe. And Crookes, what he does, he says, well, let's suppose that my process is that, like a forward process, right? what's going on. And I compare it with a reverse process to be defined, oh my, he defined it, right? But uh, to be defined by me in this talk. That just accept for the moment that there is a reverse process. And he says, look at the probability of finding this value of work compared to the probability of finding the corresponding value of work in the reverse process, maybe it's minus that, that number, is exponential like that. So what does he mean? Well, it means for instance, that if, if work is larger than free energy, the probability that this process happens forward is much higher than the probability that this process happens backward. On the contrary, if you were to have a process that violates or apparently violates the second law of thermodynamics where the, the, the work you produce is less than the difference in free energy, which may happen in a fluctuation, then it's highly more likely to, be, to happen in the reverse process than in the forward process. Let me do a drawing for that. So here's work and the two values of free energy. I have the distribution of work in um, the, the forward process that is overwhelmingly above the, 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 the difference in free energy. The distribution of work in the reverse process is somewhere there. Usually, for sake of comparison, uh, people change the sign and they plot it like that in order to show that the, the, the curves intersect exactly at the uh, free energy value. Now, this uh, technique is actually used in experiments precisely to measure free energy. This is uh, the, the first example, I think, to the best of my knowledge, where this was uh, actually proved. Um, it's an experiment that is not the typical thing we think of in quantum physics. Here, the idea is that you have a RNA uh, molecule. Apparently, don't ask me why, RNA tends to be folded in its normal configuration in a liquid. So it's really like a, like a pellet. And then, the, the, the people can, uh, the, 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 in the lab, they are able to uh, fix the RNA molecule on the one hand to a, to a substrate, and on the other hand, they put a dielectric sphere and they pull on it until the, the, this, this folded RNA stretches. Okay, so these are the two equilibrium configuration. The equilibrium configuration one is the folded RNA and the uh, stretched one is the um, second equilibrium configuration. And of course, to do that, you have to provide work. And then, so here you see that the work is stochastic, right? Here you see in this graph that I don't know exactly how to interpret, but you see the transition between one configuration and the other. 
and this in different values of the experiment in this sorry in different rounds of the experiment this transition happens at different forces why well because these these molecules are in a wet environment and therefore the you know the all the liquid there that sometimes may contribute a little bit towards helping sometimes may hinder this process and that's why there is this stochastic element and when they plot the histogram of the work here you see work that is that needed to be provided here is the ratio between the probability of observing that value of work in the forward direction in the backward direction you get the kind of curves that i showed you before this is the reverse this is the forward they intersect here and so from this intersection uh, these uh, biology, biology, biology physicists, they can get the, the, uh, the difference in free energy. That is something that is very hard to model mathematically. So it's one of these things that you have to measure. Right? You cannot just come up with a theory for that. Okay, well, let, let's leave biology aside. So, um, so, well, how do we approach this problem? And uh, I will show our approach. Uh, we share it with many people, but there are some elements that are original, and I will not spend my time in this colloquium trying to tell you what is really original of us, what is not fully original, what everybody says. I will just tell you the story as I think it should be told, uh, because well, I'm not here to claim that I'm better than other, anybody else or, or whatever. I'm just here to tell you a nice story. So let's try to uh, understand this, this kind of physics. Well, first of all, before I was speaking of um, watching the movie Backward, but this is not enough for physics. Physics needs the reverse dynamics, not just watching a dynamics and then watching it unfolding backward. What I'm saying here is what we learned in probably first year undergraduate is that uh, the, the laws of physics usually determine the dynamics, right? The Newton equation of motion are about the time evolution, but the initial state is free. And I can take free meaning that I can take any initial state. And then the laws of physics tell me that given that initial state, the final state will be something. So if I want to do physics on irreversibility on a reverse process, I need the dynamics. It's not just I take this thing and I watch the movie backward. I need to say, if I were to start from another initial state, initial of the end, okay, I'm doing the reverse dynamics. So I take a, an egg that has been broken, but differently. It's a valid initial state. And then I would want to reverse the dynamics, what happens? You see, this is a much more complicated problem. And the question that was asked uh, is, uh, is this reverse dynamics determined by the laws only? Namely, if I give you this thing, can you get me that thing? And the answer is usually no. Uh, and this was probably, to the best of my knowledge, was first proved by Watanabe in 19, 1950s. And I will try to tell you why. Okay, so let's try. Let's try to do some reverse dynamics. And first of all, we can start with the simplest thing we physicists are familiar with, is what is, this is a bit of a mouthful, right? The bilaterally deterministic dynamics. It, essentially, it means deterministic, right? But deterministic also in the sense that it's two-way. So every initial state goes into a very specific final state, deterministically, Hamiltonian dynamics, if you want. Okay, this is my forward channel, right? I have my three initial states. This one goes here, this one goes there, this one goes there. Great Hamiltonian channel. How do you reverse this one? Well, you don't need a great fantasy to, see, to understand that to reverse these dynamics, you just take the arrows and uh, flip them, right? So now, uh, if these are my initial states, uh, well, and I want to reverse this dynamics, I will send it back. So this doesn't look like very deep, right? Um, so the reverse channel in this case is indeed determined by the physical channel uniquely. And it's actually the inverse. The inverse, which is not the same as reverse in this language, I'm sorry, this language is a bit confusing, but the inverse is really the one that uh, if you compose the forward and the backward, you get the identity, right? That would be the inverse. Okay, so I think nobody here is going to be, uh, actually probably you feel that you are wasting your time listening to me speaking of that. Uh, well, there is a way of doing that. Uh, if uh, your Hamiltonian is, uh, depends on a parameter, what you have to do is to change the time of the parameter and also maybe reverse some of the things. For instance, uh, if there are magnetic fields in the, in the dynamics, 
you may have to reverse the, the, the direction of the magnetic field because of the way um, it interacts. Now comes, however, a piece of information that might be more interesting is that this is even only if. So the, 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 the reverse direction is not so obvious, right? So what I'm saying here is that the reverse channel is determined by the physical channel and, in the, and is the inverse, if and only if the forward channel is of this type, is Hamiltonian. For any other channel, this will not be the case. And let's continue. Example, erasure channel. What is an erasure channel? An erasure channel is something where every initial state gets sent to the final possibly stochastic fi uh, output state. You see, I, I try to image this by taking that the arrows that represent the probability of transition have the same thickness. So you see, from every state, you transit with probability thick to the first and with probability thin to the second, and you don't transit to the third. That's it the example I've chosen just for the sake of graphics. Now, this is a very bad channel, right? Because it destroys every information about the input. And you may think, what does it mean to reverse these? What, what, how can possibly one reverse such a channel? Okay, clearly it's not the inverse because the channel is not inverted. There's no inverse. So yeah, just don't, don't even try. And now there was this other statement that I made before that the, that the, the channel is not fully determined. And so therefore the, the, the reverse channel, the construction of reverse channel must have a free element. And what is missing here? And I will give you two answers to that. First answer, that's the physicist answer. How would you compute the reverse channel of an arbitrary channel? Well, one thing you can do as a physicist to say, oh, I know my physics, now my dogma of reversibility that everything that looks irreversible is actually reversible if I take into account the environment. So what I'm going to do is to uh, embed the system into a system times path. So now this is my system here and here I tensor it with a path. So I have now these many states. And now, aha, you know, physics tells me that here if I have the right path, um, everything is reversible. So now here I'm back to the, my Hamiltonian dynamics. Therefore, this state goes to that state, these states go to that state, these states go to this state, and so on and so forth. Of course, I haven't drawn all the arrows, that will be a mess. Now I have a Hamiltonian system. I know how to invert it. I just flip the arrows, right? And then I took out the bath and I will get something for my system, whatever it is. It works. Now, what is arbitrary? That's what is used in statistical physics. What is arbitrary is that, I mean, as trivial as it, as it may sound, the bath and the total interaction of the system and the bath are not determined by the system. So if I just give you the dynamics of the system, well, you have to invent a bath and you have to invent a coupling between uh, the, the system and the bath that were not in my original statement of the problem. You may have very good reasons to believe that the bath is like that and that the, the, um, the interaction is of the type, but my statement of the problem was just this channel. So from, the point, from this logical point of view, this is arbitrary. Arbitrary doesn't mean, I don't want to mean that it's completely you know, idiotic, right? Uh, uh, but it's, it's not defined in terms of the map. But now I want to propose you a more general approach that is to use logical retrodiction, logical inference. So here is again my problem. I have a map that takes some input states, sends them some output states, and I would like the reverse map, the one that takes the output states and sends it back to the input state, denoted phi hat. Well, one thing you can do is to choose a reference prior, like in logic. I will give you an example from logic later, but I mean, maybe I can just. So with the reference prior is like, uh, you know, since we speak about COVID, right? Um, I mean, this is a bit of a stupid example, but suppose that um, this, is a, the, the, this channel is the COVID test, right? So you have or don't have COVID, you go to the test and the test comes out positive or negative. And there can be false positive and false negatives. 
Now, this is the causal relation, right? If you have COVID, probably the test will be positive. If you don't have COVID, probably the test will be negative. The causality goes in that direction. Yeah, but what you get is the result of the test. And from that, you have to infer whether you have the sickness or not. So you have to do actually these, right? That's the retrodiction. We do it all the time, as you notice. Again, let me stress it again. The causal process goes in this direction, but the inference goes, oh, I got Y, what is the likelihood of X? And as you perfectly know, uh, these inference cannot be done from the map only. It, cannot, it can only be done if you have a prior knowledge, prior belief about, in this case, the spread of the, um, of the sickness in the population. To take an example is not COVID. Imagine that you go for a test for a sickness that nobody, at most one person in the world uh, can have, and you come up positive. Well, most likely it's a false positive, right? Because your prior belief is that only one person out of, I don't know how women you are, 7 billion people can have it. And, you know, the likelihood that's you is uh, not so high compared to the likelihood that the test has gone wrong. Whereas if you go to test COVID and you test positive, well, unfortunately, most likely it's positive, right? Because this sickness is very well spread. So that's the idea of the reference prior. You need to have a prior belief on this kind of population of DX in order to make a, a, a reverse statement. So once you have this belief, the, the, the retrodiction is justified by that. So you just say, uh, okay, this probability distribution joint, this is a probability distribution joint between X and Y, is the same as this one. Well, this one is the posterior. So this one is, if you, if you sum over X this side, this comes up to this. So this is essentially what the distribution that comes out of Y uh, after feeding the system with X. So this is only determined by the reference prior, it's not something new. And this is my reverse channel that will allow me to do the retrodiction. I will come up with more examples now, right? But okay, this is the idea of the reverse channel. Before I go to the examples, why is this higher or more general than closing the open system? Well, this is because if you do Bayesian reasoning, you should be reasoning, of course, on all your beliefs. So if your belief includes the, you know, the dogma of physics that everything is reversible, a good knowledge of the bath and a good knowledge of the coupling between the system and the bath, then you must use this, this knowledge, right? It would be stupid to say, oh, I know how where it comes from, but I don't use it. And uh, you can believe me that uh, uh, if you use this kind of vision retrodiction on a Hamiltonian uh, system, you would get the same as before. So this is a generalization, right? So if you want, what, what I'm telling you here is, if you have a good uh, dilation, if you have a good extension of your system into system plus bath and interaction, please use it by all means. But even if you don't have it, for whatever reason, you can still do retrodiction by postulating a reference prior and using this formula. Okay, let me give you an example uh, of what is this reasoning about. I, before I mentioned COVID, like, now I take a different, a different um, example. Uh, this is very, it's, it's very qualitative, right? This is a, it's supposed to represent a population in which there are men and women, that's the variable X is the gender, that are non-smoking or smoking. The variable Y is the behavior. And let's say that this is my initial belief or maybe taken from some statistics of our nation, right? That uh, these are how men and women uh, split between smokers and non-smokers. And now imagine that I go to a place and I'm told, oh, well, this is no, no smoking place. So how do I update my knowledge about the population that I'm likely to find in that place? Well, I just kill the squares that correspond to smoking and I scale up the squares that correspond to not smoking. So I would expect to find more women than men in my example. So mathematically, this means that if I tell you that I measure the variable Y and I find Y star, the uh, updated uh, belief on X and Y is just uh, uh, Y is equal to Y star, and then X is distributed uh, with the conditional probability uh, with Y equal Y star. And again, this is something very well known. 
This is called hard evidence. Hard evidence is the base rule, uh, base update rule, is the evidence of Y is taking the value Y star. I need to tell you a little bit what happens with soft evidence. So soft evidence would be that uh, I don't have a strict observation, but I know that this place is not too friendly for smokers. So I would expect that there are fewer smokers than usual, but, but how many, right? Uh, that's a bit of a problem. Okay, so how do you scale that? Well, the scaling, um, this is not, doesn't follow immediately from base rule, uh, but the rule that is canonically used is to keep the ratio between the, the genders given the behavior. So here I'm updating the behavior. I'm saying that there are fewer smokers, but I keep the gender, uh, the, the gender balance, condition on being non-smoking on smoking. I just scale up and down the squares according to that rule. This looks like this mathematically. So if I'm told that the variable Y is no longer distributed according to the distribution P of Y, but is a P prime, then I take the P prime and again, I scale my X uh, condition on this Y. This is called Jeffrey update. The idea is uh, keep this conditional belief and update whatever has been changed. Of course, this clearly works uh, in my example because uh, the constraint, you know, the, the, the change is only on smoking and not smoking. There's no direct constraint on gender. Imagine that the new evidence would be this place is not too friendly for smokers, nor for women. And of course, this rule would not apply, right? Because I would have to also shrink the women in a particular way. But here, no, no, there's no gender bias. It's just this place is wh whoever you are, it's better if you're not a smoker, right? Then, then this, this update can, can apply. Again, Jeffrey update is a very famous um, thing in statistics. I learned one year ago, so don't worry if you didn't know about it. Uh, but now that you know it, you see it everywhere. And uh, uh, it's only, sometimes it's called Jeffrey's rule of probability kinematics for some reason. Um, for those of you who are much into Bayesian stuff, you know there's something called Jeffrey's prior. It's a different Jeffrey. The Jeffrey's prior is from Sir Harold Jeffreys, that was a mathematician in Cambridge, UK. Whereas this is Jeffrey, uh, Richard Jeffrey, a uh, US philosopher of science. And it's compatible with something that Judea Pearl and uh, E.T. James uh, came up with. I will not go into that. Okay, so now what happens if I um, take my Bayesian updates and I try to compute the reverse of the erasure channel? What do I get? So be warned that the, the answer would not be a miracle. Uh, there's no miracle coming up in this talk, but it would be very reasonable. And the answer is like that. The reverse channel of an erasure channel is also an erasure channel that sends me to the reference prior. You know, what else could you expect at the end of the day, right? Here you have a channel that destroys absolutely every notion on the input. So I have no information on the input. Now I'm asked to guess an input if you want. From, I have some, 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 some input for the reverse, so some, some uh, here, and I guess to, uh, I'm asked to guess the, the, the prior time. Well, since whatever you see has no information about the, the past, the best thing I, is, I have to do is to keep my belief. And my belief was the reference prior. And you say, wow, this is very trivial. Yeah, well, what else do you expect, right? Uh, this is the earlier channel. But what is nice is this is a valid channel. I can now take any initial state and I will get something. It's not the movie watch backward. You see the movie watch backward would be that these two dots split in some way that depend on the initial state between these three. Maybe I started from this state and the move back, watch backwards would be that there was some population here, some population there, and they both converge back to here. This is nothing to do with the, the, the movie watch backwards. But it's, it is the reverse channel associated to this process. And these are the two that we are going to compare to describe irreversibility. So you see how a proper formulation of the physics of irreversibility has led us away from this intuition 
they should compare the movie watch forward with the movie watch backward, but rather we should define a channel for the forward and a channel for the backward um, process. Now, this is my only slide that has quantum stuff in it, uh, which may be surprising, right? So what happens if my channel is quantum inside? What does it mean quantum inside? It means that my classical variable X is, is used to prepare a quantum state. This quantum state possibly evolves through a channel, what we call a CPTP map, and is measured by a generalized measurement, either projective, but can be what we call a POVM, uh, generalized measurement. And the classical outcome Y is the result of the measure. Quantum mechanically, it's written like this, right? You take your state, evolve through the map, measure, trace. Then you can say, well, what is the reverse channel? Is it quantum as well? And, uh, and what type is it? Well, it is quantum as well. And how do we construct this? Well, we need the, the reference prior must lead to kind of reference state. That's my reference state that it defines by the reference prior times the, the, the collection of states that I have here. Using that, here is what comes out. You say, wow, it was such a complicated formula. So let, me, let me spell them for you. I'm sorry, someone is entering my office, but I'm giving out all. Um, so, what is the input state for the reverse process, the sigma y? Well, it must be constructed from this output measurement. So essentially, sigma y is essentially p of y. I may say, well, there's a, essentially there's plenty of stuff around. Well, there's plenty of stuff is there because uh, as you probably know, I mean, those of you who are doing quantum theory, uh, states and measurements are not normalized in the same way. States are such that trace of this object is one, Measurement is such the sum over y of these objects is the identity. So all these mess around is meant to transform a measurement into a state. Of course, you cannot see it directly, it takes some time, but you could check that if I now take the trace of this sigma y, I will get one with the condition that the sum over y of py is equal to identity. Uh, for, the, for the QX, which is the measurement of my output channel, uh, is the same idea, right? Again, uh, I construct this by taking the initial state associated with X and decorating it with stuff in such a way that now the sum over X of this QX is equal to the identity. What's more interesting is what comes in between. What is this object that uh, um, has describes the reverse channel. So this object has a name. It's called the PETS recovery map. And the PETS recovery map is something that has appeared in quantum information many times already. Uh, I will not describe all these properties, but it's essentially associated to error correction. And uh, uh, it, was, it was already uh, noticed by other authors that uh, it is the correct generalization in the quantum formalism of the formula of retrodiction, more precisely of the Jeffrey uh, update. Again, I'm not going to elaborate on that, but that's, that's the idea. So somehow, you see, this very nice. The, if my, now I can tell you, if my channel is uh, quantum inside, by just taking the quantum objects, I can immediately create the, co the quantum objects that would correspond to the channel that is reverse without having to do again all these calculations, right? Now the, the, this is automatically guaranteed to work. Okay. Next question. Which reference prior to choose? Now, those of you who are familiar with Bayesian, they know that this is a very thorny question, right? Choosing a prior is what half of the Bayesian literature is about. There are some people who say that you must choose that prior. Some people say that you can choose any prior. Some people choose it's better to do some priors, but you can do it. It's, 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 a, it's a hot topic of discussion in that community. Anyway, for our purposes, statistical thermodynamics, everybody seems to have taken the steady state. The steady state is the state such that after applying the channel, the, the probability distribution remains the same. It's not the thermal equilibrium 
or it's not necessarily the thermal equilibrium. In fact, the, the, in the processes as I described them, there may not even be a thermal bath. So it doesn't need to be the Boltzmann thing, right? Now, I have to warn you that this is one of the things that uh, appears in our phrasing of the problem. You will not find reference to uh, reference prior in the papers. Uh, these assumptions are spread in a series of assumptions that go under the names of detailed balance, micro reversibility, and other stuff. What is the reason to choose a steady state as a reference prior? Well, you may say, um, let's take as a reference the process where nothing seems to happen, right? Either forward or backward. So it, if I come back to my analogy of the, of the, of the movie, well, if you take the steady state, um, well, you say that uh, even if I'm watching, if you have a glass of water and nothing is happening, whether you're watching the movie backward or forward really would not make any difference, right? So that might be the, the rationale behind that. In some cases, I think the rationale uh, to be a bit, a bit unfair, maybe to some of my colleagues, the rationale was just that everybody has chosen that before. So we keep the same assumptions because we know with the same assumption, we get the same theorems without much of a, let's say, thinking. It's incredible you know, how many people you find. It is natural to assume that there is detailed balance. Okay, well, it's natural. Uh, now, piece of information that you may or may not care. If you don't care, just forget about it. But I tell you anyway that uh, you may want to have a more information theoretical approach to this problem and say, well, there is a prediction and there is a retrodiction. And this depends on a reference prior. I would like to choose the reference prior that minimizes the distance between these two distributions, um, what is called the cool back library distance or the relative entropy. And strangely enough, in that case, you should choose the uniform state. So the state that there's probability, equal probability for every state, uh, for every pure state. And this was to have been proved for uh, discrete state space. It, it is not necessarily the steady state, right? Only bistochastic processes have the uh, uniform state and steady state. So here we see already that by going to a more information theoretical approach, we start asking questions that people have not asked before. Namely, that you may want to choose some other reference priors than the steady state. And it has a reason, at least as an operational interpretation. Anyway, if you didn't get this one, no problem. Let me, however, this is very important, however, for, for, for the last part of my talk, is the, is the difference between the reference prior and the actual priors. So it's useful to see this question as a game. And the game goes like that. Um, the, uh, there is a, a referee, right? That is challenging, a predictor, and a retrodictor, okay? Alice and Bob. What are these people being given? So the predictor is given the definition of the channel phi, the physical process. The retrodictor is also given the definition of the channel phi, the physical process. But the predictor will be given an input and we'll have to produce an output according to this distribution. That's kind of obvious, right? All of us can do it. The retrodictor is a much more unfair task because the retrodictor has been given phi and we'll have, it will be told a y and we'll have to produce an x. But as we said, in general, the knowledge of phi is not enough to create this guy, the, the reverse channel. So the retrodictor, before even starting the game, must postulate his reference prior. And at that point, he can compute something. He can give output x compatible with the reference prior. But there is this bias, right? So this is an unfair game in which the Predictor has a much easier task or a much better defined task than the retrodictor who has to introduce the element of arbitrariness. Yeah, that's uh, so. That, so, this, 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 what I wanted to say here, apart from repeating this very important statement, is that uh, the retrodictor will need to postulate a reference prior before the game starts. Now, the referee. We don't know with which probability distribution is going to sample X and Y. Maybe completely different from the reference prior. So what it means is that the predictor will sample, sorry, the referee will sample X with a probability PX of his choice. That has nothing to do with the reference prior that 
the retrodictor has chosen in order to construct this channel. This is what we call the forward process in the game. And there will be a backward process in the game. Again, the referee chooses with absolute freedom which prior to give to Y, prior for the reverse process. And this is the reverse process or the retrodiction. Okay, well, it took me some time to explain this, but uh, it's a usually a question that comes up very often. What is the difference between the reference prior and the, and the real priors that are used in the, in the physics? Well, this is the difference, if you want, in terms of in game theoretical terms. That the reference prior is something that the, the retrodictor must postulate before starting the game in order just to be able to write down what the reverse channel is. Then the game is played with the priors that are chosen by the referee that the, the players don't need to know. Oh, entropy production. Well, um, the beautiful formula, look at this. The entropy production is the logarithm between the, the entropy production in a transition between state X and Y is the logarithm of the ratio between the probability of going from X to Y in the forward process and going to Y to X in the reverse process. You may think, wow, where does that come from? I have no idea. Um, or oh, oh, let me, I have some ideas. Um, first of all, let's notice that uh, an apodictic justification is unlikely. Apodictic means that uh, general, uh, as my students like to say, is general, right? So, why? Well, because in the, if you take my example of gender and smoking, right? Um, I don't. I, I wouldn't even know what entropy production means in that case, right? These are states that. So um, it's unlikely that I can prove that for every probability distribution, the PF over PR logarithm is the entropy production. What has been proved is that this formula seems to be valid by inspection in several models of statistical thermodynamics. So yes, that, that's, it's, it's not a completely arbitrary stuff that someone throws there and says that that's entropy production. People have made some models and has found that this quantity in those models, there's a Langevin equations, a Brownian motions, thermal, thermal bath, and uh, all this is entropy production. Uh, great, in some cases at least. Now, uh, this formula has a very appealing property is that uh, the average value of these entropy production over the forward process, which is the physical process. So if I, if I were able, uh, we are not, huh? but if we are able to measure this entropy, sample this entropy values, sample with which distribution, with the distribution of the forward process, I get the uh, statistical distance, the kullback level distance. So this is, if you want to, this is the random variable whose average with respect to PF is the kullback level distance. So that's already nice because it tells you that entropy uh, is related to a statistical comparison between forward and reverse processes. And it's even nicer. Well, I would say prediction and retrodiction. It's even nicer because it gives you a second law of thermodynamics for free. Uh, the kullback level distance is known to be non-negative for every probability distribution. It's asymmetric. You see the, the, the role of PF and PR is not the same. And it turns out that this quantity is always positive. And of course, this average would be nothing else than the change in entropy at a macroscopic level, right? This was the change in entropy for the microstates, X and Y, and I'm averaging over the process. And so you see that, again, uh, this doesn't mean that, uh, I mean, the fact that it has nice properties doesn't mean that it's correct all the time, but it's a very um, pleasant uh, expression whenever it's correct of entropy production. And now you may say, well, uh, where does your Bayesian stuff uh, appear here, right? Uh, well, here is a result that we don't know what to do with. It might be one of the deepest things we have ever discovered, but we have to study a bit more. I will tell you what it is. Maybe some of you have some idea. Maybe you can prove it uh, in some way that, um, so the, the, the reverse process is defined with the Bayesian retrodiction if and only if, the microstate entropy production is a difference between two functions, one only a function of y, the other one may only a function of x, maybe a different function. Uh, maybe a different function because the entropy is a state function only for uh, quasi-reversible processes, whereas here I don't want to make that assumption. So in other words, if you want this property, 
to hold for your thermodynamical system, you are obliged to define your reverse process with a thermal, with a Bayesian retrodiction. Of course, the connection between the reference prior and these entropies is given here. Now, why do I find it potentially very deep? Because when you compare, uh, you know, there's this famous question out there of whether thermodynamics is physics or is information, and uh, uh, people discuss a lot of things. What is P and Q? Oh, uh, the, the, the priors, the real priors. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, you know that in this question of whether the thermodynamics is physics or information or both or, or neither, the typical discussion is whether the thermodynamical entropy takes a form that uh, can be interpreted as a information entropy. Like, in which cases the thermodynamical entropy takes the form of Shannon entropy. In which cases the thermodynamical entropy can be phrased as a uh, any entropy or uh, all kind of other entropies that have some interpretations also in information theory. Here is much deeper. Here I told you nothing about the form of these functions at, to start with. I just tell you, if entropy is of this type, the, 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 the reverse process is constructed with logic, with Bayesian retrodiction. So it's a very deep connection if, um, if, if it is a strong one, if it is a, a universal one, let's say, it's a very deep connection between logic and thermodynamics, irrespective of the debate of whether the um, shape of the function is the one that you like. Okay, now let me finish. The last two slides are about uh, these famous fluctuation relations, right? We start with Jarginski and Crookes. Let me derive them for you. And now you're going to see that I'm going to do a, a derivation in two times that is never done in any other paper. Uh, first, I will do a formal derivation that will be essentially a triviality, in a sense, a statement of mathematics that you would say, well, yeah, yeah, thanks. And then I will apply this uh, trivial mathematical identity to a very specific physical case, and we will recover Krajewski and Crookes. So that's the trivial part. Let's assume that I am interested of a random variable, omega of z, that, that takes this form with p1 and p2, two different probability distributions, uh, two probability distributions, maybe it'll be the same, but that would be a kind of trivial uh, example. And they don't need to be related in any possible way, right? just p1 and p2. Why would we want to do that? Well, because it looks like entropy production. Anyway, now you may ask, what is the distribution of the random variable omega in, uh, according to the distribution P1 of Z. Well, you take your Z, you sample your Z with probability P1, and then you associate to omega the variable omega of that Z, right? That gives you the distribution of omega according to P1. The distribution of omega according to P2 is the same kind of thing. But now I can do a very simple trick, which is that, you know, this one, um, P2, I write it as P1 over P1 times P2. As usual in, uh, in thermodynamics, in all these kind of statistical mechanics things, people assume that uh, the probabilities are never zero. If you really want to have probability equal to zero, I will replace it with 10 to the minus 200 and I challenge you to find the difference. So that's my, my way of doing it. As you see, a mathematician among you may be scandalized by this attitude, but um, I'm a physicist. Anyway, uh, and now you see what has happened here. It has happened that mu2 is essentially equal to mu1. You see there's p1, there's delta, and there's a factor here. But this factor by construction, because I decided that my random variable is this, but this factor is just exponential of minus omega, right? That's where I'm really using the fact that my variable is of that type. And so I, bring, I can bring it out of the, uh, because it's a delta function, I can bring it out here. And what have I got? I got mu two of omega is equal to e to the minus omega mu one of omega. That's just because I decide my random variable omega to be of that type. So I told you it was a triviality. If I integrate over omega, what happens on the left-hand side, 
uh, I'm integrating a full probability distribution, so you get one. On the right hand side, I get well the average value of um, e to the minus omega over the distribution mu one, which is a physical one. Well, here you have Crookes and Jarjinsky, at least formally, right? So that's the structure that goes on in uh, in those fluctuation relations. Let me now do the second step, which is to actually recover Crookes and Jarjinsky in their physical setting by now admitting these formulas and just giving a meaning to P1 and P2. That's the only thing that is left. I will give a physical so here it is. First of all, I take again PF and PR according to my definition of uh, retrodiction, so this P1 and P2. And the process that they were considering, remember what I told you, is you prepare a thermal state for a Hamiltonian at time zero. Then there's an evolution. The evolution is the Hamiltonian may depend on time. There's a parameter there, maybe. And also there is exchanges with uh, uh, the, the thermal bath. And then there is an assumption of microreversibility. I don't know what it is. And then you post-select or your final state or your state of the reverse is a thermal for the Hamiltonian at time t. This is time, capital T is not temperature. Huh? This is uh, the, the, the final time of the, of the evolution. Okay, let's, let's plug these physics into this formula. Well, that's easy. Prepare thermal for H0 means that I prepare thermal for H0. So my, my, if you want, in my game uh, language, the referee is sampling the variable X with a probability that is thermal according to the Hamiltonian H0. The free energy in this case is just a normalization constant here. Okay, that's kind of easy. Okay, got it. Similar for the post-selection. Now, a bit more work to do for the evolution. First of all, micro-reversibility, what does that mean? Well, I told you before that it means that I'm going to choose the steady state as the reference prior. So, um, so this ratio here, if you remember, this ratio was the ratio of the reference priors. There was a, a hat on this one, but because it's a steady state, the hat has disappeared. So this ratio is just replaced by the, um, uh, by the ratio of the values of the reference prior, steady state. So that's, okay, that's an important assumption. Now here you see well, there is something very nice, right? That the, the, this ratio now depends only on uh, point functions and the point functions are the prior, the end process or the prior of the reverse and the steady state. The rest of the process has disappeared. Only the steady state matters. So in a sense, only equilibrium properties of this channel matter in this moment, right? A change with the bath, what does that mean? Well, um, if you want the steady state and there are changes with the bath, well, in, in a word, this means that the, the, the steady state is a state such that the energy that the Hamiltonian creates into the, the system is equivalent to the heat that is dissipated in the bath, right? We start from a state and we have to end up in the same state. What happens in the process? Two things happen. The Hamiltonian may change and there is dissipation into a bath. But if we want to end up in the same state, then you know there must be this balance, right? That whatever energy is created into that state, it must be taken out by the bath, which I've written in this kind of formula. This is not a heat, this is just a parameter. Huh? So what did I get? Well, and I plug everything in, right? There's an exponential here, an exponential here, an exponential here, I plug all the exponentials in there, and you get exponential of beta times change of energy. Again, energy might have changed because Hamiltonian depends on time, minus the heat that was dissipated in the bath, compared between the, the two states. And of course, the, 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 two, uh, the difference between the, 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 the free energy that comes from these terms. Well, but you know, uh, change of energy minus heat is equal to work. And this is exponential of um, omega, right? So my variable omega of the previous slide 
is beta times work minus delta F. And that's what goes into Crookes and Jarginski, if you remember from my very first slides, indeed the fluctuation relations were in terms of this variable, work minus delta F times the inverse temperature. So you see how this is very nice because now having the Bayesian retrodiction here, I can get immediately uh, the physics that I want. Now you may want another process. You may say, no, I don't want the exchange with a bath. I want exchange with five baths. Well, you know, just, just go through the calculation, change your things and you plug them back into the fluctuation relation, you get a fluctuation relation for a system that starts in equilibrium, finishing in equilibrium, and exchange with five baths. You may say, I don't want to start in thermal equilibrium. Fantastic, don't start in thermal equilibrium, just change this guy into something else. And you find a fluctuation relation for whatever happens, right? So you see that now you have full freedom. And so we'll finish with these. Uh, what is the philosophy there? So the, let's give credit to Satoshi Watanabe, who uh, in 1955 uh, wrote this review of modern physics. It can be shown that the actual success of a retrodiction depends on the satisfaction of an additional condition, which is not required in prediction, namely the reference prior. Even more clear in 1965 in this paper that uh, is a kind of strange journal, but you can, if you, if you Google Watanabe 1965, you find this online for download. PDF, and this is the abstract. It is contended that the phenomenological one-wayness of temporal developments in physics is due to irretrodictability and not due to irreversibility. So uh, he's adopting a rather, uh, let's say, subjective way of irreversibility in which uh, is not really a process, but is our logical problems, right? This irretrodictability is shown to originate from a simple property of the very notion of conditional probability, independent of the structure of dynamical theories. So you see that I've, I've assumed that it's possible that the underlying dynamics is unitary or not unitary, uh, that is Hamiltonian, not Hamiltonian. That's not where the problems come from. The problems come from the fact that we need a reference prior. It is demonstrated how macroscopic irretrodictability can be reconciled with microscopic retrodictability in classical physics. That's very well known. That's more or less what I was doing with my bath, right? And uh, you can add the bath and then uh, everything goes through. Then he says, quantum physics is irretrodictable because of the measurement problem, if you want. Microscopic as well as macroscopically, whether it is invariant for uh, any symmetry that was the debate at this time, whether which, which symmetry is the symmetry of quantum mechanics, or not invariant at all in any such sense. I mean, his goal here was really to decouple the discussion of whether time reversal is a symmetry for quantum theory from the discussion of whether um, irreversibility comes from, okay? So his claim is that uh, you can have a theory that would be time reversible and still have irreversibility because of this irretrodictability thing. That this reference prior, this element of arbitrariness that you must add in order to, um, to, to reverse the process. So let me finish with a summary. I hope I'm not too late. No? No. Uh, so we formulate, so this is a more philosophical summary. We formulate physics based on our perceptions, right? Uh, these are, we are humans. Um, in, and uh, um, and we have these processes. I mean, these perceptions tell us that there is a process that went from X to Y. So here I am accepting the arrow of time without any derivation. I'm, I'm not claiming that we can derive the arrow of time. I'm just saying, well, we observe an arrow of time. We're trying to do physics because our data look like that. Having formulated this physics from X to Y, anyone trying to describe physics from, X, from Y to X will face an element of arbitrariness, namely again, the reference prior. And entropy captures the statistical asymmetry due to this logical asymmetry, or at least could capture. Of course, uh, I have bad news for Raphael and for all of you is that uh, this summer I decided to stop playing soccer because my knees ache, and it's a bit hard to uh, attrib attribute that to um, irretrodictability, to my subjective feeling, it really aches. Anyway, whatever. So I thank you for your attention. And by the way, uh, we have postdoc positions open, one in particular to work on these kind of things. Uh, Singapore is still uh, uh, fighting COVID, uh, but uh, there's 
we are optimistic that uh, soon uh, things will be lifted and will be great again to be in Singapore. So if any of you is interested in a post or position or know someone who could be, please uh, contact me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Valerio. Great talk, very clear. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, it's, it's sad news to, 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 to hear that you, you're not playing football anymore. But anyway, yeah. So uh, do we have uh, any questions? Yes, Giorgio. Hi, um, thank you very much for, thank you very much for a really interesting talk. By coincidence, yesterday I watched a seminar by a mathematician from the Courant Institute who showed a formal equivalence. I mean, it was very technical and I'm a physicist as well, but he basically showed an equivalence between chaotic systems for which the ergodic hypothesis might be true and stochastic systems. And the idea there was that the initial conditions under certain hypotheses um, start obeying the Kolomogorov probability axioms. And so it's really a formal equivalence. This seems to be very similar to what you're talking about, right? And uh, I mean, except, except for the fact, I mean, it's exclusively classical systems. There is no quantum mechanics there, although they are chaotic. And the ergodic hypothesis, it is sort of controversial when things like Poincaré recurrence relations and things like this start applying for realistic systems, right? So yeah, okay. There, so my, yeah. my comment to this uh, would be that, uh, but first of all, uh, uh, I've been in this field for a very short time, so I cannot really probably, um, I mean, I may make incompetent comments at this point, but. Uh, um, in, in all that we have done so far, we have no, nowhere we had any need to uh, postulate or unpostulate the ergodic hypothesis, right? It, it's just uh, um, really logic and uh, everything else is kind of, you give me your channel, whether it's chaotic or not, whether it's, um, that may, of course, if it's chaotic, it might lead to very bad retrodiction, right? In the sense that indeed, I mean, that's what just happened, right? I mean, uh, but you're postulating ignorance of something. I mean, <laughs> well, it's not postulating. Is what I am ignorant. I mean, if, if yeah. those who are postulating are those who are believe that they can write a bath of harmonic oscillators, and that this bath of harmonic oscillators with the x x coupling suitably describes uh, exactly what's going on in a thermal bath. That that what I would call a postulate. That again, it might be very justified if they are ready to believe it. I, I respect their belief as a as a good Bayesian, but to me that's a kind of postulate, right? Or why that would be harmonic oscillators uh, and interacting with XX coupling, right? Um, so uh, I, I think that there's not, no need to postulate ignorance. I think there's rather need to postulate certainty whenever we, we have it, right? Or we believe we have it. So um, yeah, now I have no idea uh, how this uh, research project will pan out. Maybe at some point we will hit a wall or we will hit the need to a narcotic hypothesis to, to move to something else. But it, it's perfectly possible. I, uh, I have to admit that uh, I cannot predict the future uh, much better than the past. Uh, and so uh, the, the result that you mentioned is certainly something that I mean, is worth knowing, and I didn't know of it, of course. Uh, and maybe we'll play a role in a couple of years in, uh, in what we are doing. In this moment, I really cannot comment more on, on things related to ergodic assumptions and other standard assumptions because well, I don't need them, or I haven't, I haven't needed them yet. He didn't really need the ergodic hypothesis. He needed chaos, which with Lyapunov exponents, which are large enough. Well, I also don't need those, right? I mean, that, that this will be, for me, this would be kind of, let's say, applications, right? You may have, I mean, for instance, if you take my, my reverse channel here, this, this erasure channel, if you could see this as a Lyapunov exponent infinity, right? It destroys absolutely everything. It's not even... There's no trace of the initial condition. It's not that, that it's sensitive to the initial condition. You just, you destroy absolutely everything. Well, uh, you can still define a reverse channel. Um, so of course, okay, well, maybe one thing that I should add here is that one of the things we assumed in this work is that we know the forward channel perfectly well, right? Of course, if you, uh, which also these people do, right? By the way, when you write a chaotic channel, you think, okay, oh, hey, the, the, the map is this one. 
and there is noise. I add noise in the map, so you know the noise, right? Um, so that's what I'm assuming here. Of course, if you say, you know, there is a noise of unknown source, well, then, of course, my, my, my reversal, I will have to be a bit careful here, and I have no idea how to deal with that. One of my colleagues here is doing these kind of things. Um, but uh, so under the assumption that my model of the channel is correct, yeah, and I'm making an assumption, uh, the rest is, uh, yeah, I, I don't need anything else. But again, you know, we just recover fluctuation relations, right? We didn't recover the whole of thermodynamics. So maybe uh, trying to recover something else at some point will hit a wall. So, yeah. Thanks. So, are there any more questions? So I'll, I'll have, I have one question then. Uh, regarding this, this last thing that you said, uh, do, do you have any idea on how to recover anything else from, from this approach or is I mean, it uh, too, too speculative yet? My, my next step is this one, right? My next step is to understand whether, uh, uh, in, in, which can, in which systems it is true that entropy production looks like this. Because if you really look, you can read that all the review papers on the field is all, all that I've read, this is formula number one or two. And they say it is well known that entropy production in statistical mechanics, statistical thermodynamics is given by these references, one, two, three. You look at what is happening, one, two, three. One is a, you know, Langevin equation, uh, Brownian motions, very specific models. And since then, it seems that a lot of people in the field somehow believe that, that this is entropy production and they compute with that. Of course, there are people who don't do that and they are much more attentive in defining entropy production. So there are many different definitions of entropy production. And what I need to do now next is to uh, review all these things and to see if all of them can be somehow brought back to these or not, right? Maybe there are some version of entropy production for some process that cannot be produced like that. In which case it would beg the question, what does it mean? that uh, the, the reverse process is not entropy production. It is not um, uh, logical uh, reversibility, right? Uh, I, I, I cannot even understand what it means that to say that we define a reverse process in a way that is not compatible with logic. <laughs> Sounds a bit bizarre. So uh, uh, there can be all kind of things happening, but, uh, and I'm sure people have opinions about that, but uh, yeah, I will take my time. Sorry, uh, since you since you you said that P and Q are priors here in this formula, right? Yes. What about gamma? Gamma is a reference prior. It's the, prior, the, the prior that the retrodictor has to use in order to define the channel. P and Q are the priors that are used by the, play, by the referee to sample the, um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the inputs. So one enters before even we start playing the game in how do I define the, the reverse process? And uh, in, in, st in statistical thermodynamics, it's usually taken to be the steady state. The other ones are really the games we are playing. If I go back to my Jarkinsky thing, the, uh, the prior of Px and Q are thermal states. The reference prior is a steady state. Yeah, these are notions that take some time to digest, but uh, I, I think I'm getting more or less comfortable with them, but I understand that it takes some time to, 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 to digest all these things, yes. It is a question there. I have a question by Camille. Yes, hello. Uh, uh, yeah, so I, I enjoy very much your talk. I have a question on the last part. Uh, so when you re-derived the, the Jadzinski uh, inequality, uh, so you, you mentioned that um, that so with your, your yeah exactly this slide that then you can choose any initial or final distribution so not necessarily thermal distribution yep. and uh, so yeah my yeah, i'm not an expert on 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 Jardinsky inequality but so from from what i've been reading it's mostly known for for initial uh, equilibrium or, or thermal distribution uh, ah, yes, yes, yes. So 
Uh, okay, let me say like that. So first of all, all that you have read, apart from my paper, will assume thermal distribution because these people were paralyzed in their framework. They didn't have a, you know, a more broader framework in which, so everyone who does Jarginski, every single one will write thermal states because everybody does it, right? Now, maybe a more important comment is that, uh, maybe I should have been more precise here. If I change my distribution, right? The, 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 the final variable, of course, will not be work, right? I mean, the, the fact that this thing comes out to be work, well, it's because this is the difference of energy and this is the difference of heat. If I change my process, maybe this variable would be what John Bell would call unspeakable. Namely, uh, you and I wouldn't have a nice narrative, a nice name to give it to it, okay? But it doesn't change the fact that I could plug it into these relations and get a formal Crookes and a formal Jarginski equality. You do just have fluctuation for something that you don't know how to call, right? And maybe it doesn't make any sense, I would, I would say. It doesn't have any macroscopic meaning, right? But what I, mean, what I meant by that is that really the, nothing in the formalism is a slave of these choices. The fact that you get something you can, you can tell your friends, they you have something for work, that, that, that does depend on the process, yes, definitely. Okay, so, so if I understand well, what you're saying is that uh, from 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 this expression, you could generalize the the Jarzinski inequality, Crook inequality, or equality uh, to to whatever initial state. But then the the physical interpretation won't be so nice, or won't be so clear. I can apply to women and men smoking, and then I don't know what, I don't know what uh, this variable be for women and men smoking, but I can certainly find out. In fact, this is an interesting, for me, it's an interesting research direction for people a bit more, uh, let's say, um, uh, open-minded uh, than, than the traditional student who wants just to compute a rigorous thing is, can you find a meaning of this expression for women and men smoking or for COVID and uh, uh, sickness or for uh, races in America and voting for Trump and Biden? Can, can you find a meaning of fluctuation relations for this kind of real life stuff that don't have an obvious interpretation in terms of entropy, right? Certainly the formalism is there. You just have to tell me mm -hmm. what, what do I learn about the American election process if I throw it in a Jarginski equality, right? <laughs> uh, This I don't know. Okay, thank you. May, uh, I have uh, also a comment. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, some time ago I, I was so, uh, uh, in fact, reviewing a paper I was so, uh, leading with, with this uh, Jadzinski, Krug's inequality and so on. And so I, I and I, I have also the same kind of doubt, like I didn't really understand deeply what was this retro dictability and not retro dictability, but the microscopic reversibility. And uh, I mean, all the standard uh, assumptions that people put in the papers. Uh, I understand that they needed at some stage for, for, for having property on the, on the probabilities, but the physics behind it, I didn't quite understood. And uh, <clears throat> I finally, so, so making some calculation, I, I finally managed to derive the, the Crookes inequality, uh, sorry, Crookes equality, mm -hmm. uh, without even uh, speaking about the reverse process. So only. Uh, but Crookes uh, is unlikely. Yeah, Jarzinski, you probably uh, you you can you can derive Jarzinski without speaking of the reverse process. Not Crookes. Crookes is used defines the. Ah yes 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 yeah no sorry you're right. The the Jarzinski inequality without uh, yes. without even speaking about the the reverse process. So meaning all this notion of of. Uh, uh, yeah, microscopic reversibility and so on was even not uh, needed because you, you don't need to, to speak about the reverse process. But, but so, it's, it's hidden. It's hidden because as you see here, uh, what you're doing when you do a Jarzinski is actually, you are saying that the reverse process is correctly normalized. Um, and indeed, indeed the Jarzinski equality can be described only on the, uh, on the forward process without having to 
refer to a reference process. The meaning of that is a normalization of probabilities, um, which is kind of, so by the way, this means that if you find another paper one day where they claim that Jardinsky is violated, so there's another number than one here, well, be careful. Mm -hmm. that's, okay. That would be my, my, my interpretation. It's true that for specific models, uh, the Jardinsky equality can be proved um, without any reference to the, to the, without going through this path, without integrating Crookes. In fact, Jardinsky himself proved it, right? Before Crookes, because it's before, right? So Jardinsky mm -hmm. defined a process, computed some stuff, and he said, well, look, this, this average uh, ends up being these, right? Is, is what I wrote here, that Jardinsky proved uh, this. For that particular process, he proved that without going so integrating this guy. Ah, yes, yes, yeah, true. So that's that's fine. Um, okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, we have time for maybe one last quick question. By the way, congrats for managing to cite John Bell in, in, in your talk. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want to ask any questions. So, yeah, if there are no further questions, uh, I would like to thank Valeria once more. Thank you very much for your very nice talk. For listening. And, well, I think that's, that's it. Okay, thank you, and have a nice day. Okay. Thank you, Valerio. Thank you, Valerio. Thank you. Thank you. I hope to, to, to see you more and more often than <laughs> once yeah, every hope. couple of years. <laughs>